Koga Hap. Today is the 29th of September 2022, and now is the time to train our minds to cultivate mindfulness, to make mindfulness continuous and connected. This quality of mindfulness, recollection, the quality of sampajanya, clear knowing. These are two dhammas that are very beneficial and useful. So we understand that mindfulness is right mindfulness. It's a factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. So we practice walking meditation, sitting meditation. Our quality of sila, or virtue, is full and complete. Then we give rise to samadhi, collectedness, and wisdom. This is the way to true peace to freedom from all clinging to all sense objects, to freedom from clinging to materiality and mentality. We can also realize a temporary freedom. Our mind feels empty. And this mind, our heart, is this knowing element, this knowing element that knows all sense impressions and these sense impressions having been known, if we lack wisdom, then the knowing element proliferates and is lost in these sense impressions, in materiality and mentality. And this is a cause for suffering to arise. So we train our minds to have firm mindfulness. We set our hearts on this. We have the faith to practice in this way. This is something very important. This is the duty of monks or monastics. Jintai is called prat. And this word prat means that which is exalted. And so for laity that practice and set their hearts on the cultivation of merit and the abandonment of demerit, then they can be prat, they can be exalted as well because it's not just the yellow robe that makes one a monastic or a uh, exalted one, but it's something that's in the heart. So one who practices to abandon that which is unwholesome, practices patient endurance, practices virtue, and uh, realizes uh, the state of a sage, or being a wise person. So we do sitting meditation, do walking meditation. When we sit meditation, sometimes we feel peaceful. This is the development, cultivation of our minds and hearts. We have these human bodies, and we bring the mind to the level of the human and when we practice like this, then our minds can go to the level of a deva, a heavenly being. This is called a manusa deva, a human deva. This is a merit in the mind. So we have this chance to develop and train the mind to become higher. And this is to continue to further the Buddha sasana to further the dispensation of the Buddha, to make it continue on. Because we have the building of the buildings of Buddhism, like chedis and meditation halls and so on. These are the material things of Buddhism. And then there's the, the those who have faith in Buddhist teachings, in the Buddha sasana, they have the faith to offer the four requisites of robes, uh, food, shelter, and medicines to the Sangha. So we have these physical items, but then we have the people of the Buddha Sasana, which is those who practice the teachings, whether monastic or laity. And these people of the Buddha Sasana are religious people, and they're very important. Because if you only have the physical things of the religion and no one practices, then there won't be much result from that. There won't be much fruit. But one who comes to practice, then they're able to know clearly into the Dhamma, 
to see the the Dharma that's taught in the Buddha Sasana. And this arises in one's own heart and mind, realizing the teachings that the Buddha taught. And this can happen for monastics or laity. The mind understands the Dhamma. This is the mind that is pra, a mind that's exalted and lofty. So to ordain in the Buddha Sasana is something that has great benefit. It makes one a relative of the Buddha Sasana. In the time of the Buddha, there was King Bimbisara, who had a lot of faith in the Buddha Sasana. He was a stream enter, he had realized the first stage of enlightenment, and his quality of generosity was very high, was the best, and he had well established virtue, and he practiced the teachings but he was still not considered a relative of the Buddha Sasana. But then when a relative of his ordained, and then he was considered a relative of the Buddha Sasana. So one comes to ordain, even if one ordains for only a short time, Lung Pu Cha would teach that even one who ordains for a short time, not a long time, but they really set their hearts on the practice and they strive, then it's possible that they can see the fruits of the practice clearly. One doesn't just let time slip away and have no benefit. One strives to cultivate mindfulness, to make the mind firm, to make the mind peaceful and collected, to understand that all materiality and mentality is impermanent, stressful, and not self. This is something of immense benefit to one's mother and father. They get the full benefit. This benefit lasts for 80 kalpas. It's is uh, truly a great benefit. And so uh, a child comes to ordain, and that mother and father can feel a very happy feel a lot of fullness in their heart, feel a lot of joy. So this is a great merit, a great benefit that arises from one who comes to ordain. And one who comes to ordain, they put on the robes of a monastic, and they're wearing the banner of the arahants. They set their hearts on the practice of the Dhamma, and they give rise to the wealth of sila, the wealth that arises through the practice of virtue, and make the practice of virtue complete, and they strive to develop their mindfulness, to contemplate the four requisites of food, robes, lodging, and medicines, to contemplate them. We contemplate them before we use them, that these four Requisites are just composed out of these four natural elements of earth, air, fire, and water. And these bodies of ours are the same, just composed of these same four natural elements. And these elements change according to causes and conditions. So we contemplate this. So we use the material items of the four requisites. Then if we don't contemplate as we use them, then in the evening we contemplate again. This is the duty of monastics. They must contemplate like this. Because these four requisites, we use them regularly. So we practice like this. We train in mindfulness. And for monastics, when we come to the meditation hall, when we arrive, we bow to the shrine when we leave, we bow, bow to the shrine. When we enter our kuti, our monastic dwelling, we bow to the shrine there. When we leave the kuti, we bow to the shrine again. This is the practice of recollecting the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. We do this bowing a lot. It's the cultivation of mindfulness to incline the mind to the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha more and more. This is something that's good to do. Then in the four postures of sitting, standing, walking, lying down, 
we have the opportunity to cultivate mindfulness. And then whether we're eating, moving to and fro, walking on alms round, eating out of the alms bowl, we practice to speak little, to awake with effort and energy, to have a lot of strength and energy. We may sleep four hours a night, or four and a half, or five, or five and a half hours. And there's some lay people that sleep just four or five hours in a night and wake up and go to work. And for monastics, they wake up in order to meditate, in order to train their minds, to go to morning and evening chanting, and to do this with faith. So we practice like this to make our mindfulness firm and well-established, to have these path factors of sila, samadhi, and panya gather together. And then when this happens, we can understand the Dhamma. It's not difficult if we do it with continuous effort. And why is that? It's because the nature of impermanence, suffering, and not-self is here already. And the Lord Buddha saw this nature and taught, taught beings about it. And one who has not very much defilement or not very much kilesa is able to understand this. Like Venerable Anya Kondanya and a group of five ascetics, the Buddha taught them that everything that is of the nature to arise is of the nature to pass away, that all things in the world are like this. And this truth of nature is open and revealed already, whether a Buddha comes into the world or not, nature is like this already that all conditioned things arise and cease. So we walk the path of virtue, collectedness, and wisdom, and bring our minds to peace and collectedness so that we can see the truth clearly, to succeed in seeing the Dhamma. And these qualities that lead to success, like wholesome effort and energy and effort, we practice to have mind, a lot of mindfulness, a lot of peace and collectedness. And we have wisdom to know conditioned things. However it is, then know it like that. Know it clearly. And having known clearly, one sees the Nama. In the beginning we see it just bit by bit. It's like we're eating a meal. We eat one bite at a time. And then we feel that we're close to being full. And then we keep eating and then we feel full. Dhamma practice is just like that. In the beginning we want peace and collectedness. But the mind is chaotic. We want to see the Dhamma. We want to see it quickly. This gives rise to doubts. So the way to bring the mind to peace to use a meditation object, like the in-and-out breathing, reciting Bhutto, Dhammo, Sangho. We can also recollect uh, merit and goodness that we've done, like helping those in society. And when we recollect this merit and goodness, it can bring our mind to stillness. We may have used our time to travel far to help people that are having a difficult time, to help those in trouble. And when we recollect this, whether walking or sitting, this can give rise to fullness and happiness in the mind, to help those that are in difficulty. So we recollect this merit, this giving and sacrifice. This is Chaganusati, the recollection of that which we have given. And we have loving-kindness as the foundation of our minds, to care for our minds, to have virtue to care for our minds. Our mindfulness and samadhi will increase and become stronger if we have loving-kindness. And if we have loving-kindness, then our samadhi won't degrade. 
This will help our wisdom to be clear and to increase in its clarity. So may you all practice like this to cultivate and develop these knowing elements to give rise to clear understanding. Because if we don't practice, if we don't train, then the mind just thinks in terms of self all the time, me and mine, you and yours. And doing like this, then we have to be born into the cycle of birth and death, must born and die, born and die over and over. So we practice sometimes, and sometimes our mind is very chaotic. We close our eyes, and it's like our mind is spinning here and there. This is normal. So have mindfulness with this. Have mindfulness in the present moment. And one can investigate, is the mind liking or disliking, falling into attraction or aversion, and bring the mind to the middle. This is the way to see the Dhamma. So no, knowing this, then one doesn't have any doubt. One can strive in the practice, and it becomes easier and easier. It's difficult because if we don't practice, we don't gain any fruits. So in the beginning we have to force it. We have to force ourselves to walk and sit. So we have faith and may we have wisdom as well. So may you all say your hearts on this practice. One who has the chance to come ordain, this ordination is something of immense benefit to undertake the holy life, the brahmacharya, to see the drawbacks in sense impressions, these things which make the mind chaotic and cover over the mind to make it busy and distracted, these hindrances of liking and attraction, of ill will, of sloth and torpor, of restlessness and agitation, of doubt, Sometimes we have liking for the objects of the six senses, for sight, sounds, smells, taste, touch, and mind objects. Sometimes we feel annoyed or aggravated. Sometimes we feel tense and stressed. So we have to train our minds. And this ordination is something greatly beneficial. The one who ordains must set their hearts on the practice. They may study the text or strive in the meditation to give rise to Dhamma understanding, to give rise to the state of liberation and freedom in the mind, which is the goal of Dhamma practice. This is the goal that the Buddha wished for us to know and see the Dhamma for ourselves. So may all of you, whether one who's uh, a lay person or one who's ordained already, one who's ordained supports the Buddha sasana and helps their relatives as well and gives oneself the opportunity to set one's heart on the practice to develop the mind. Even if one ordains just for a short amount of time, it's still possible to see and know the Dhamma it's something that's not difficult to do if one's spiritual virtues are ready. So may you all say your hearts on this practice of Dhamma.